Welcome to episode two of the Music of Middle Earth. I'm your host, Jordan Rinells. I'm a musician and teacher, uh, but I also have a passion for fantasy writing, illustration, and really anything creative. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a bit of a guided tour through Howard Shore's incredible music from Peter Jackson's adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. So if you tuned into the first episode, then you heard how we take a deep dive into how Howard Shore built this amazing score. That being said, the books are what I love the most, so uh, we're going to be talking a lot about what Tolkien wrote and how Shore's music evokes those ideas and themes. Any excuse to get uh, back into his writing is, is so worth it. Um, now take a minute and imagine this. Imagine being Howard Shore and facing this task. Average movies have maybe a handful of different pieces or themes throughout. There are nearly a hundred themes that Shore created for The Lord of the Rings. Imagine undertaking that. We're going to get into the details of how he made this happen in later episodes with the recording and the writing process. But for now, we're just going to explore every theme one by one. So stay tuned for all that. As far as themes are concerned, though, we're really just starting the journey and there's so much more to come. So if you enjoyed these episodes, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so other people might get a chance to see them as well or share it on Facebook. That helps a lot as well. So we started last week with the first of our four-part series on the One Ring. So if you missed the last episode, be sure to check that out so that you have all the pieces of the puzzle. Our guide for the layout or roadmap, I'll say, of this podcast is coming from The Music of the Lord of the Rings by Doug Adams. Pretty amazing book, and, and I'll definitely include the link in the show notes for that so that you guys can check it out. I really encourage you guys to check it out and, and maybe even follow along as we go through all the themes. It's really, really worth it. Um, so for every episode, we get yet another great reason to dive back into not only the books, but into Tolkien's extended legendarium as well. This includes a lot of work that Christopher Tolkien, Tolkien's son, has since released after his father's death. Christopher really made it his own life's work to share a deeper story of how his father created these great works. We really have to thank Christopher so much for all of this. But now, uh, without further ado, in the words of Tom Bombadil, time to dig deep. In the last episode, we talked about the history of the ring theme. So we dove into, as you might guess, the history of where the ring came from and a few things along its journey. This week, we have the second theme of four that Howard Shore created for the ring. This is the evil of the ring. Let's take a listen. <laughs> Very simple, but a lot to talk about here. We hear this theme for the first time in its entirety in The Fellowship of the Ring, right as we have that first full reveal of Barad-dûr, and Gandalf has just left for Isengard. A very powerful brass section brings this one home in its first complete rendition. There's one other instrument included, though, which, which gives the theme a bit of an exotic flavor. It's a double reed instrument called the Reisha. We'll talk in more detail about that later on, though. We only hear this theme a few small times through the Fellowship, but uh, as we get into the Two Towers, we, we hear the theme expand, more instruments join the orchestra, and it becomes more and more powerful, the closer that it gets to Mordor, and, and as its hold on Frodo grows stronger. When we get into the Return of the King, we hear the evil theme start to take hold. Sauron can feel the ring getting closer, and it starts to take over the other ring themes. We also start to hear a combination of the history and the evil themes, but we'll get into that uh, later on in the episode. I'd like to open with a few words from a letter in Humphrey Carpenter's collection, The Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien's answering a letter here from Rona Bear. She wrote to him with several questions so that she could pass them on to fellow Lord of the Rings enthusiasts that she was having a, a meeting with. We won't go into all of the questions, but the, the main question that we're going to be looking at Tolkien's answer for is, how could our Farazan defeat Sauron when Sauron had the One Ring? Now, we aren't really concerned about the directly related answer, but more what Tolkien brings up about the ring uh, and the philosophy of such a device in literature. I definitely encourage you to get into uh, those letters and explore all of this in detail, though. So Tolkien says, This question and its implications are answered in The Downfall of Numenor, which is not yet published, but which I cannot set out now. You cannot press the one ring too hard, for it is, of course, a mythical feature even though the world of the tale is conceived in more or less historical terms. We'll start here. Tolkien understood that 
he was attempting to show this world he'd created as if it were being told from a historical point of view, much the same way that Peter Jackson impressed the importance of his films feeling historical and not fantastical during the pre-production of the movies. So in the DVD appendices for The Fellowship of the Ring, Peter says he told his design team that we've been given the job of, of making The Lord of the Rings, but from this point on, I want to think that The Lord of the Rings is real, that it was actual history, that these events happen. And more than that, I want us to imagine that we've been lucky enough to be able to go on location and shoot our movie where the real events happened. Those characters did exist, and they wore costumes, and, and I want the costumes to be totally accurate to what the real people wore. Hoppeton still exists, it's overgrown with weeds, and it's been run down and neglected for the last three or four hundred years. But we're going to go back in there and clean it up. I love that dedication, and I think it really is what, uh, what drove the realism of the project. Tolkien himself spent years creating and thinking out the history of and details of this world. George R. R. Martin, um, the author of the Song of Ice and Fire books, Game of Thrones, described his own writing and his peers as, to this day, still just being imitations of Tolkien. That Tolkien's writing is, is that classic image of an iceberg that, with the tip sticking out and so much detail below, unseen. All that detail. And that George's own writing, by his own description, is, is like that same image, but the tip of the iceberg is just sitting on a raft. And there really isn't much underneath holding it up. It just looks like there is. I thought that was a really great uh, description and a really great compliment to, to Tolkien from Martin. So Tolkien and by extension Jackson see that the world they're bringing to life is, is through a historical lens. This doesn't hide or even attempt to hide the fact that there are still mythical and fantastical elements. But really embracing those fantastical elements as true and not something to be taken lightly. I see this lens of history to be the reason the story earns such respect and seriousness for its fantasy and mythical aspects. Tolkien goes on in his letter, The Ring of Sauron is only one of various mythical treatments of the placing of one's life or power in some external object, which is thus exposed to capture or destruction with disastrous results to oneself. If I were to philosophize this myth, or at least the Ring of Sauron, I should say it was a mythical way of representing the truth that potency, or perhaps rather potentiality, if it is to be exercised and produce results, has to be externalized, and so, as it were, passes to a greater or lesser degree out of one's direct control. A man who wishes to exert power must have subjects who are not himself, but he then depends on them. You can read the rest of uh, his response in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. But let's discuss this quote. It really describes how that potency, in this case the evil within Sauron, is transferred to the ring. I see this as Tolkien saying that in mythic and fantastic stories, great power or potential power, whether it's physical or emotional or anything in between, often has to eventually be externalized. We see this happening again and again in fantasy stories. A great example is in the Harry Potter series. Lord Voldemort gains so much power that he eventually outsources part of himself into significant objects. These are called horcruxes. A piece of his soul is imbued in that object after he's killed someone, creating an object that holds a piece of that power, but also an external reliance, just as Tolkien describes. Another great example is actually from A Song of Ice and Fire uh, by George R. R. Martin. As one of the main characters, Jon Snow, becomes older and more of a leader, he becomes more and more in tune with his dire wolf, Ghost. Jon and his wolf, Ghost, are intertwined souls that, that grow more and more together as the tale continues. That power that Jon has is resonating in Ghost and, and reliant on their connection together. I would definitely see this as coming back to that main fantasy mythical idea that Tolkien's talking about for the ring. So the ring is not just some weapon of great power, but the embodiment of the idea of too much power. Power that's gotten out of control, that it needs to be passed on to an object, or a vessel of some sort, as in Jon Snow's case. Though that one is definitely a, a little bit more subtle version of this idea. As Tolkien says, he then depends on them. So the actual creation of the ring to hold such power may ultimately be a significant part of Sauron's downfall. 
I'd like to next read a section from near the end of our story, jumping all the way across time. Let's read from Mount Doom, chapter 3 of book 6 in Return of the King. And also, as far as spoilers go, I think it's uh, best to do us all a favor and assume here that there really isn't much reason for anyone to listen to something like this without knowing kind of what the story is going to be ahead. Uh, hindsight is a super powerful tool, so I wouldn't want to miss out on that um, by worrying about spoiling anyone. So let's jump into uh, chapter 3 of book 6, Mount Doom. The light sprang up again, and there on the brink of the chasm, at the very crack of doom, stood Frodo, back against the glare, tense, erect, but still as if he had been turned to stone. Master, cried Sam. Then Frodo stirred and spoke with a clear voice, indeed with a voice clearer and more powerful than Sam had ever heard him use, and it rose above the throb and turmoil of Mount Doom, ringing in the roof and walls. I have come he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. And suddenly, as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight. After all that they've been through, after all the things that Frodo has seen and heard and how terrible he knows the ring is, after all of that pain and suffering, he can't let it go. The ring has taken him. This is where the evil of the ring theme derives its meaning. When the ring and Sauron has a purpose to fulfill, it is unwavering and relentless. All right, I know we're all super anxious to dive into the theory of this theme, but before we do, we have our mid-mark segment. Today we have Instruments of Middle Earth. This segment is dedicated to great opportunities like the Evil of the Ring theme offers us. In this and many themes to come, we have very specialized instruments that were chosen by Shore to create a mood or feeling or flavor. In this theme throughout the movies, we often hear the Reisha instrument. This is a double reeded Moroccan instrument. It adds a slightly different color to the theme. Let's have a listen to what that sounds like on its own. Such an awesome sound from that instrument. So it's a North African instrument and has a few similar instruments such as the Arabic Mizmar and the Turkish Zerna. It's really interesting, somewhat similar to the oboe that we have um, that we might be more familiar with. Let's actually listen to the oboe on its own as well. They're pretty similar in tone, but the Reisha has just a bit of a different flavor and exoticism to it. So while I was doing some research on this instrument, I read that uh, a few composers actually try to get their oboe players to mimic the sound of the Reisha by just sticking the reed a little bit further into their mouth, um, and this gets a bit more of that tone. Um, Howard Shore is actually cited as one of the very small group of composers to use this instrument in their work for film or orchestra settings pretty interesting. So there you go, that's just a little taste of the of the ratio so that we can hear it when we jump back into the theme. So let's do it. So listening to the evil of the ring theme again, we hear this power and relentlessness that we discussed earlier very clearly. I've also added a ratio sound as close as I could manage uh, for that added layer. The brass instruments in the ratio are strong and powerful 
piercing really, but more importantly, there's only a few notes here and, and most of them are long held notes. If we actually count all the different pitches, we really only get three in total, just, uh, just dancing a little bit around between those. Let's listen to each one of them on the piano as we go through. C sharp, D, and C sharp again, D, C sharp, B flat, C sharp, D, C sharp, D, C sharp, and then B flat at the end. So really just those three notes, and with that we, we get this clear, concise idea. No need to play tons of different notes. Another fantastic example of this simplicity is actually can actually be taken from Hans Zimmer's theme for The Dark Knight from the Batman movies. Let's have a listen to what that sounds like. Just a super simple idea that with dynamics and articulation creates a very powerful emotion. This is one reason why music is, is so impressive and useful as a composer for film. Only two notes in this Batman example, but so much weight to it. Back to Howard Shore though. We, we also hear that there is um, what might be slightly unfamiliar to Western music influenced ears, this augmented second in the Evil of the Ring theme. Don't worry about the name of that, just listen to how it sounds. This has a lot more of an exotic style sound to it, whatever you might interpret that as. It's really just that it's, that it's unfamiliar to our ears a lot of the time. It comes in part from what we might call a harmonic minor scale in Western music theory. This is what a regular minor scale sounds like, and this is just a collection of seven notes in a certain order. We're not going to get into the details of that, but it's just a collection of notes. So let's hear what that sounds like. This is the A minor scale. Now let's listen to the A harmonic minor scale, a little bit different. I'll play them back to back one more time. You can hear immediately that this second scale, the harmonic minor scale, pushes us a little further into unfamiliar territory for our ears. There's something different about it. Now, often in music theory classes we're unfortunately told what we should be hearing in these scales or chords or whatever it might be. Um, that this group of notes sounds happy and this, and this one sounds sad and this one bright and this one dark, that kind of thing. I encourage you to listen and come to your own conclusions as much as possible. I know that I'm giving you a few little kind of ideas of what it might sound like, and mostly that's just because that's how Howard Shore is using it in his score. But when you choose for yourself how it makes you feel, then you can internalize it better and, and put it to use better uh, later on. So let's take a quick sidebar to show an example of what I mean by that. For simplicity's sake, I'm not going to give the technical names for what I'm playing. I'm just going to play them and tell you what I think of them when I hear it. It is important, though, to say with this that, that what I'm describing is simply what I think of and, and that you can and should do this exercise and, and see what you come up with for yourself. So here's my first example. For me, this sound makes me think of sitting in front of a fireplace, a wood-burning fireplace like I had at home growing up. Snow outside, the smell of the smoke, and the warmth of the fire. 
Now if I play this chord, just one note added on top. Then that picture stays mostly the same, but maybe there's a bad snowstorm outside. Maybe we've lost power. There's a bit of uncertainty in there. Here's example one again. And then something else, a little uncertain added on. So the point is to explore these music theory terms on your own, with your own ears. What does it sound like to you? Listening to the evil theme again. We hear those long held notes, and then this quick descending section that has that augmented second that we talked about. Those long notes really display the power of the ring, but the evil aspects of it come through the instrument choices, that loud and aggressive brass section with the extra texture of the ratio on top. It also comes with that slightly uncomfortable augmented second. We're not used to that sound. It throws us into a very slight unease. This theme is so to the point as well, which really showcases the ring and therefore Sauron's desire. Sometimes we hear the history and later the seduction themes, and they offer a different angle on the ring, but this evil theme is where everything is laid out in the open. So now I do want to share a really interesting combination that starts to happen as the score progresses. We'll run into more and more of these as we, as we go, and especially way down the road, when we start to go through the movies scene by scene to see how all of these themes are, are coming together. You definitely heard that right, by the way. Eventually, when we're done all of the themes... We're going to be going through the movie scene by scene to see how all of this intertwines and plays together. I can't wait. It's going to be pretty awesome. Um, anyways, as the ring gets closer and closer to its master, we start to hear a sort of hybrid of the history and the evil ring themes. And this is played on the French horn, trombone, and tuba. So we hear a little flavor of both, the power and strength of the evil theme as well as the contour and cyclical nature of the history theme that we talked about last episode. Howard does this kind of thing throughout the score, intertwining themes and ideas. Let's take a listen one more time. that there for now but we'll definitely be diving into that more as we go and especially in those future episodes so what else can we pick out from uh, the evil of the ring theme why brass instruments we talked about the ratio but not about the actual brass sections on their own in howard short score he tends to associate brass especially low brass and more kind of modern sounding instruments you could say with evil aspects of the score We'll see that in a, in a few different themes along the road. Um, the brass instruments of the orchestra include things like tuba, trombone, French horn, trumpets, etc. Um, and we really get that powerful, striking sound with them, while the strings in, in the last episode gave us that elegance and beauty. Don't get me wrong, horns can also sound that way. We'll hear that when we get to Gondor's theme and, and a few others. When they are played like this, however, it can really be terrifying, that blaring sound. And that's really what Shore is trying to evoke with this theme. The emotion is fear. What can this little ring really do? 
the way that this theme punches itself in clear and precise and on a mission is, is hard to miss in the movie. So in this theme, we heard the, the power of Sauron coming blaring into full view, only a few notes, and we have a very powerful theme. We also talked a little about how different note choices can create a whole other feeling and mood. Um, and we also talked a little about how different note choices can create a whole other feeling and mood. So I'm really excited to check out the theme for next episode, which is the seduction of the ring. Let's take a quick listen to that. something completely different. We have the boys choir for this one. Um, so how does the ring pull people in? Who will fall prey to its influence? We'll check out all of that in the next episode. As always, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or ideas to add to the episode, then be sure to send me an email at musicofmiddleearthmail at gmail.com. That wraps it up for this episode of The Music of Middle Earth. But thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Unwearied then were Durin's folk. Beneath the mountains, music woke. The harpers harped, the minstrels sang, and at the gates, the trumpets rang.